Okay, I think we will get started. Um, thank you all so much for joining us on our uh, last Breakfast Club event of the week. Um, I know there's some of you here um, that have probably joined us in a number of our events earlier on the week. So thank you so much. Um, hope, as I always say, I hope you have your tea and coffee at the ready. One of our panelists, Chloe, said she just grabbed her tea uh, to get started. Um, and as a lot of you will know, um, I will start with just a, a very brief intro into the firm and then we will move back to the panel discussion. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, some of you will now be well aware of who we are and what we do and why we do it. But at Evershed Sutherland, we are um, uh, the only All-Ireland Fully Service International Law Firm. So we're based across the globe. So we have 68 offices in 32 countries. And that would span Europe, Asia, the Middle East, um, as well as the US. So we merged with the US in 2017 and we now have eight bases there. And on the island of Ireland, uh, we have our Dublin and Belfast office and we very work very much closely together in a collaborative partnership. Um, and our clients, uh, we provide legal services predominantly to Ireland's largest and progressive clients, but also smaller, exciting and innovative companies, as well as international companies as well. And I suppose if you ask, you know, what's unique about us or, you know, something that we are particularly proud of and is our international presence, we can provide that legal service seamlessly across the board. And often we will have clients that may have offices based in a number of different countries across Europe. And the fact that we can liaise very easily um, with our international colleagues um, is a huge, I suppose, benefit and unique selling point to us. And it's one of the reasons, I think, as well, why people want to work for us and with us. To be able to work with international colleagues on international project work is hugely important to us. Um, so to bring it back, I suppose, today's panel, um, today is all about giving you guys an opportunity to meet some of our trainees. We want to give you a real sense as to what it would be like for you if you were to come and join us as a trainee or an intern. Um, we want to give you a sense of, you know, our trainees' journeys from studying law to FE1s um, to going to Black Hall and completing PPC1 and PPC2. Some of our group have actually completed them online. Um, to giving you a sense of what it's like to work in the office, you know, what are rotations? like what is it like to work directly with partners and, and solicitors um, and then what can you do as I say you know outside the job beyond the job you know CSO or social and obviously some of that has been impacted with COVID-19 but we'll have a chat to you about that also and what I would say for this session is we really want you guys to get the most out of this so I would encourage you to ask as many questions as possible throughout this session we will answer them throughout so there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and I really, really would encourage you to ask us as many questions I know our trainees won't mind. So without further ado, I, am, I will ask our trainees to introduce themselves and I might start with yourself, Chloe. Yeah, um, so I'm Chloe. Um, I'm post C 2 as it says there, and I'm currently in construction and projects. Um, I studied in DCU and I did the BCL Law and Society there um, and I graduated in 2014. Uh, so yeah, that's me. Great, thanks Chloe. Robert, what about yourself? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Rob. I uh, am post PPC1 as you can see and I'm currently in real estate, uh, though I'm due to move to funds uh, in the next week or two uh, at the end of my first rotation. Um, I went to Trinity uh, where I studied law and uh, and then I went to King's where I did a master's in medical law. Um, so that's, that's my at the moment. Great, thank you. And Elise? Yeah, so I'm the same as Rob, I'm post PPC1. Um, I'm currently in litigation and I studied in UL and I did law plus. Uh, so that means I did law and psychology. Brilliant, thanks. And I might come back to yourself, Chloe, because we've often talked about your journey today. And I think a lot of students will wonder, you know, um, do I do masters, do I not? Or some students on, on this call today might not even have a legal background and that's absolutely fine. And your journey is a little bit different to some of our other trainees. So do you want to maybe have a chat about that? Yeah, um, so as I said, I graduated in 2014 and at the time I didn't really have any interest in being a solicitor. Um, I kind of just thought I'd maybe work in industry and that law would be a good background. But I actually worked in-house in a legal team uh, for an international fintech company. And it was there I kind of actually got a grasp of what the solicitor's work was would like. And um, so then after about 18 months of working in-house, I then started doing the FE1. Um, 
and then was doing that while working and then I left my job to do the summer internship with Evershed to see whether or not I actually definitely wanted to be a solicitor um, and yeah and now here I am so hopefully qualifying in March so uh, yeah it's been a good journey to date um, and it was great as well because I have a summer internship then I kind of had the opportunity to do a bit of travel before then starting Black Hall as well so yeah it's worked out pretty well for me. <laughs> Great, thanks Chloe. And we might touch on some of those points later on, like FE ones and travel. So if you have any questions around that, I, I often get asked at careers fairs, you know, timing and when to do things and you know, should I have FE ones done? And you know, with the rules around FE ones changing, sometimes some some students now are choosing to do them throughout university. So if there's any questions on that, you know, fire them into the QA and, and we will touch on it. Uh, Robert, what about your journey? Can you give us a little bit more detail about where where how you got to where you are today, I suppose? Yeah, uh, so as I said, I, I did a, a pure law degree in, in uh, Trinity and I think the, 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 the law degree there really does push you towards solicitor life anyway. I'm sure a lot of our uh, attendees today will have seen various panel discussions from various firms. Um, but when I left, I had a particular interest in medical law. Um, I have a, a medical background in my family, so it was an area of law that I found quite interesting. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to go straight into the FE1s or, or what I wanted to do. So I decided to do a master's in medical law in, uh, in King's in London. And I stayed on in London. I decided not to do the FE1 straight away because it was just enough studying for me. So I, I worked in London for a year um, in a firm called Field Fisher, who recently opened here. And then I came back, did the summer internship with Chloe, uh, I think in 2017. And then Got my FE ones out of the way, uh, did a bit of traveling as well, and then I was into Blackhall last year. Uh, so that was my journey from Trinity to, to here. Brilliant. And Elisa, I'm putting you on the spot now as well, but I think the journey question is quite interesting just to see where you are, you know, where, how you got to where you are today. So would you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I, like I said, I did Law Plus in UL. Um, which was a great course. It allows you to combine law with like a, what it's like. I think there's like 20 different things to choose from. Um, so you get like a bit of a mix when you graduate. Um, but I decided anyway that I was going to go down the law route. Um, but like that, I traveled for a while. Um, I went to America um, and then I came back and did the FE ones in the following March and then kind of started i was in-house for a while um, in a pharmaceutical uh, company um, and then i interned in a smaller firm and then i got the training contract and that's that's where i am now <laughs> Yeah, and I suppose the difference between Elise and Chloe and Robert is that Elise um, secured the traineeship having not interned with us before, uh, whereas Robert and Chloe had interned. So it's just, just to, to point that out as well. So Elise, staying with yourself there, um, I think what's hugely important to a group, whether they're going forward for internships or traineeships either, what, they, what students need to be looking for is, okay, where are they going to get really good quality work? And where are they going to be able to liaise directly with partners and senior associates and and you know develop and grow personally and professionally so can you give you know working in litigation now what does a typical day look like for you yeah so uh, typically i guess every day really varies um you can be involved in anything from research be it like client research to research in a point of law um there's a lot of drafting um depending like i was in corporate before obviously drafting depends on the seat um but definitely a lot of drafting which is something that i think like trainees work on as they go through seats um then attendance a partner can ask you to come in on a call with them um just to take a note on the main points sitting in on meetings doing minutes and then of course with litigation um there's a lot of prep for court so court booklets um going down to court which maybe in covid i i didn't do as as much maybe as what you usually would have done um but i got to sit in a lot of virtual trials which was cool because they haven't really been done before um and yeah like i said it varies very much from department to department but overall i think they're kind of things that every trainee will do um in a seat it's kind of expected so yeah yeah and Chloe I might come to yourself on that question as well because construction projects and um, sometimes it might not be at the forefront of people's minds when they think of going in and doing rotations and um, but construction and projects um, is really popular amongst the trainees as is employment and IPIT I was talking to a couple of students um, earlier on in the week about their interest in IPIT 
So construction projects, can you just give us an overview? Of, like, what type of work do you do there? What does that look like? Yeah, construction projects, um, I, I think people kind of think like, oh, it's just building and stuff like that. But it's actually, it's like, well, our firm, it, it's a lot more far reaching. So um, it covers like obviously construction, which will go into, you know, what you imagine like housing, estates, apartment blocks um, and hotels at the moment. Um, but it also covers like PPP. So kind of like building colleges and refurbishment of colleges in Ireland and um, social housing. Um, and then also then we also have the energy side as well as in, in the department so building wind farms um, and like solar energy and then also pr public procurement as well so kind of uh, putting things out to tender um, on behalf of the state or you know helping people apply for those things so it's a lot of different work very varied and it keeps you on your toes uh, especially as I'm just three months in um, but it's really interesting work um, and the department's great as well because, you know, they're kind of aware that there's so much different type of work there and it is all quite commercial. Um, so you do get a really good kind of grounding of different like abilities, you know, whether it's drafting and, you know, or kind of like assisting with like, I know in the, with, on the energy side, I've helped with kind of nearly like banking transactions nearly. And um, so it's very varied and, I'm already learning a lot, um, which is kind of intimidating at times, but uh, no, it's great. It's really interesting department. And Chloe works for three partners, so she's completely stretched <laughs> across the team. Um, it's, it's really, really busy, um, as are most of our trainees are, are stretched across working. Mostly they work directly with the partner and the team that works under that partner. So our trainees can be working for three, four, if not a few more at some times. Like if you're in banking, we've kind of three banking teams and you'd have two trainees in there balancing the three teams. So it's, um, it means that they get really high quality work, but they're kept um, nice and busy as well. Um, and Chloe, how do you, what I think a lot of people want to know is um, the rotations, you know, um, and they kind of vary from firm to firm, you know, some firms do like three rotations and um, some do five rotations now as well. Can you just give a rundown, okay, as, as to what rotations look like and a few areas just to give them a sense of where rotations can be completed in every shed Yeah, so um, generally most rotations are about six months long, so uh, uh, in our from anyway it is and like I didn't do a pre-seat so I came in straight after Blackhall uh, and I went to litigation um, and I spent six months in litigation and then I moved to banking where I spent six months and then I went to PPC2 which obviously now is not going to be you won't have that kind of a break from the office um, but and so then now I'm in construction and then I'll have one more seat before I qualify uh, in March and um, so yes so like I've covered banking as well and, and fun litigation and now construction projects. So lots of different things, even in that mix alone. Um, and then as well, obviously there's like pensions, employment, tax, IPIT, which I just mentioned. Um, I'm probably failing to mention the other kind of uh, like education, things like that. The, the list goes on. But uh, and even then as well, they're like litigation, property uh, and corporate, there's already there's so much different work, even within those kind of core groups, you know, um, like I worked on Stephen Barry's team in litigation, which was just planning and, um, well, not just planning, but like health and safety. And but yeah, that would be kind of very different to maybe like Elisa's experience in litigation as well, even though we're both going into course, we're both doing similar trainee work, but it's very different uh, materials kind of there that uh like subject matter that you'll be dealing with even within those departments so um yeah you, there's always a lot to learn anyway for sure brilliant and and chloe mentioned a pre-seat there so um if any of you aren't sure what a pre-seat is and um, it's the rotation completed prior to starting your time in black hall so it's your very very first rotation um, and what you guys need to get a sense of is if you're joining a firm for a traineeship one do they run rotations um, and two, would you like to do, well, do they run a pre-seat rotation um, and would you like to do a pre-seat? Some firms won't run pre-seats and some will. So, for example, Chloe didn't do a pre-seat, so she'll qualify in March next year, whereas some of her other intake did do a pre-seat, so they don't have a final rotation left and they'll qualify at the end of this year. So it's basically four months prior to starting PPC1. Um, so our trainees actually start their, their rotations at two different times of the year whether they do a pre-seat or whether they don't. 
Um, and if that just makes sense, throw me a question in the Q and A. Um, and we have a question here. Um, it's for yourself, Robert. Um, was doing an LLM worth it? And we often get asked this, we often get asked, you know, should I do a master's or, you know, is it worth it or should I go straight in? So what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I found it worth it because it was an area I had an interest in. And I think that's really a core element of whether or not you want to do a master's. I don't think it's particular, particularly a position where if you applied for, say, the, the traineeship in Eversheds, and I had a master's and you didn't, that I'd look any better or anything like that. I think you have to really want to do it uh, and find an area that you're interested in. My, my, my master's was just great because I, I, got, I got to move to London. I, um, I, I, was, I was there for a while. I had a great time, but I don't, I don't think it, there's any sort of advantage to doing one in terms of traineeship applications because we have such a variety of backgrounds that people come from. So I wouldn't look at it from the sense of, do you have that kind of traineeship application advantage? I'd look at it from a position of where you want to go. Do you want to go into this area of law? Have you an interest in it? I wouldn't just do one for the sake of maybe getting an advantage in a traineeship application. But I think sort of from an academic perspective, I, I found it very interesting and something that I really enjoyed. Yeah, and I, I think Robert hit the nail on the head because um, in HR we often get to ask, question, ask that question, do we do a master's or not? It is exactly what Rob said. It comes down to area of interest and do you have an interest in an area? So if you are doing it to put down the application, then I, I wouldn't advise it. And um, when it comes to applications, um, you know, people ask, how much does that sound, stand out on application? And look, it's brilliant to have a master's. It's fantastic. And, um, you know, and it, of course it stands to you, but we could have two applications through and one has a master's and one doesn't. But that other one may get through if they have stronger, you know, overall application. So just because you have a master's doesn't mean you're going to get through. It has to be your master's and everything else on that application needs to come up to par. So, you know, when we look at the applications, we're looking at, okay, academics, work experience and in the back of the application how well you answer those questions and it's a blend of all that that pulls your application through not necessarily they are excellent academics so they have to get through they they nothing on your application stands alone it has to all form together to form an all-round strong application and um, but if you have an area of interest absolutely and um, it's fantastic thank you for that question and um, so another question um, from Jennifer. Hello, Chloe, Elise and Robert. My question is for Robert. I'm wondering what, do you, what you would think of doing some FE1s while in a master's. Do you think it's a manageable workload? Um, honestly, from my master's, that I think would have been a bit too much um, because at the same time as doing my master's, I was also applying for traineeship applications in London. And I know that the quality of my traineeship applications actually suffered due to my balancing with a master's. Um, I think if you were then trying to do that and juggle the FE1s, from my experience, the FE1s require, they, need, they, they do need a good bit of time. I took uh, about two months of study where one month I was working and I was studying in the evening and then one full month in the library every day from you know, nine till 10 just giving them work because they are, they are such a heavy endeavor and I think it's just it's best just to get them done in as few sittings as possible uh, so I wouldn't try and balance too much I think the FE ones they, they, they should they get the respect they deserve because they they are a very heavy endeavor um, so I wouldn't try too much uh, at the same time as them yeah thanks Robert and what I would say Jennifer about the FE ones as well is you know you don't have to have and um, sometimes I find there's confusion particularly at careers fairs about FE ones so you don't have to have your FE ones to secure your traineeship so you could secure your traineeship go do your masters and then go on to your FE ones and talk to you know the HR team because you might say to the team look I've I've applied for you, I've been successful, but can I, can I push that traineeship out a little bit? I really want to get this master's behind me. So we'll support you in getting the master's behind you and maybe starting your traineeship a little bit later and giving you time to get those FE ones done so, so that you're not too bogged down uh, with it all, I suppose. So thank you for that question. Um, next question, would a trainee be able to opt in for the pre-seat if they completed their final FE ones in the March sitting? Um, I don't know if, if anybody wants to take that question. Um, I can also answer it. Um, 
The answer, I suppose, is yes. And um, so if you complete them in March, your pre-seat doesn't actually start till April or May. So we start our pre-seats on either the end of May or end of April. So you would have plenty of time to sit that. Now, your results wouldn't be out. And um, so we'd be telling you to come in um, and work with us, um, not officially as a pre-seat, but we would then count it later on down the line. So the answer to that is yes. But you do need to be passing, obviously, your F we like to see people passing their FE1s in the October before they start. So they have that March where there's a little bit of leeway. Um, but yeah, you absolutely can sit them in March and start in the office prior to BBC One. We've often done that and we do each year. So that's fine. And um, my question is for all of the panel, what is the application process like for both internship and traineeship? Yeah, so maybe starting with the internship, would one of you like to give a sense of, of the application process and how you felt about it and, and if you have any tips? Um, yeah, I'll take the internship anyway. Um, it was a while ago since I did the application form, but as far as I remember, it was it was quite similar to the trainee application. Um, but I, I think for me, for applying for anything, I think especially for well for Evershed, I was very much kind of upfront about who I am. Like I unfortunately am an Olympic rowing person. I don't have any accolades like that to my name. But um, I was kind of very like you know this is what I like to do. This is how I spend my time. This is why I want to work in the firm. Um, and I know when I went in like well especially like my my traineeship interview anyway after the summer internship one. Um, I had an interview with Tony McGovern, who's one of the partners, and you know, he looked at my application and was like, so what's the best gig you've ever been to? Because I had said that I like going to gigs, and it like completely threw me, but um, you know, I was like then talking about going to see Beyonce, and like in my interview, and you know, here I am, I, I, think, I, I think I'm at the firm I should be in, uh, and even little things like talking about like how I played tag rugby when I was on the, like, when I played in when I, I played tag rugby, sorry, when I was in house, and then I continued to play in the summer internship when I was in Evershed. Um, and yeah, I just think if you kind of put across your personality, that you don't know if you're the right fit for the firm. Um, and then the summer internship is great because you can kind of really get an idea if that is the firm for you because you know they could re you know they could like you, but you kind of say actually this maybe isn't for me, um, and you can kind of then pull away. But um, Yes, that'd be my advice is just to be very much truthful. You don't, no one's expecting anyone to, you know, be Sonia O'Sullivan and also like trying to apply for traineeships and do it FE1s and do masters as well. Uh, I don't think anyone expects them to be totally superhuman. So yeah, that would be my advice anyway. Thanks, Chloe. And I think you've touched on a good point there. And I think everybody's probably sick of me talking about culture and finding the right fit for you. But Chloe, again, has, has probably touched on it there again, that, you know, you, you have to like the firm and you have to like where you work. And the key part of that is research beforehand or discussions like this, where you get a sense of the people that work there. The culture has to work for you because it's such a long road for you. And when you do start your traineeship, I know the guys are probably like, finally qualifying and um, you know it's a long it's a long hill road and it's a great road and it's a fantastic road but it, it has to work for you and i think being your true self is exactly what we're looking for we're not looking for a particular type of person we're looking for, to get to know you and, and who you are and um, robert elise do either of you want to pick up on that question as well yeah sorry my laptop just fell off the table there but anyway um <laughs> A uh, virtual um, was yeah. So with the training application, um, I think definitely what Chloe said: be yourself in it and be honest. And then also, I found with mine, it's it's no harm sometimes, obviously, to read over it loads of times yourself, but don't let yourself down by putting in like silly spelling mistakes or whatever. Maybe give it to someone else just to have a quick glance through before you send it off, just to make sure because sometimes you know you kind of you can read things a million times and you won't spot it sometimes just make sure that the thing that you're sending off is you're 100 percent happy with it you know take your time with it don't be in a rush just to send it off take your time and you know make sure that you've kind of eliminated anything that they could say about like your grammar or your spelling and then yeah obviously be honest and be yourself yeah absolutely robert is there anything because i'm conscious that it's such a popular question is there anything that you would add to that um, yeah, I think I, I definitely, I have, I have a story about a bad traineeship uh, interview, which I did, and 
I had put something down in an application which I just couldn't back up at all. Um, and I think that you've got to be careful with doing that. You can't just put down things that you're expected to put down because someone will ask you about it and then you have nothing to say. So it's definitely a case of be authentic, just put down what you honestly think about firms. I think there's a definite case of people seeing that all the applications are due at the same time for all of the firms and copy and pasting various things. And if you have an application for Evershed and you've got Arthur Cox written somewhere in there, you know, that it clearly just shows you didn't put the time in. So definitely read it, definitely take your time over it and do a bit of research just to know why you actually want to join the firm. Don't just put it down for the sake of everyone else is doing it. Um, and yeah, it's just a case of taking time being, being honest with it and don't, uh, don't put down you're interested in cycling when you're not. And then you get asked <laughs> about a doping scandal in an interview and it didn't go well. Oh. So uh, yeah, do, do that. And what Robert there is, it, you know, it, it actually happens. So <laughs> word of caution, you know, um, I had another candidate before they put something down um, and they were asked about it and it really stumped them. And they knew nothing about it, but thought it's something that we might want to hear about. So definitely does happen. And um, thanks guys. And thank you for that question. Okay, the next question. Does it look bad to sit FE, sit FE ones without working at the same time? There are fewer job opportunities at the moment in the firms due to COVID, but I don't want to seem lazy. Yeah, good question. Um, maybe I, I might touch in on this, but before I do, can I ask the panel, did you guys work through FE ones? I actually uh, did. I did a bit of work, um, but I definitely took the time. I was, I was working in Eversheds at the time with Ashley Gannon's team on litigation. And uh, I was actually able to take the time off that was needed for them. So a month to either side before the, uh, the, the FE1s. I don't think that it would make you look lazy at all. Passing the FE1s itself shows that you have some grit and some, uh, some, some motivation to get through them. Um, I think that it did help to balance. The FE1s can be quite a long slog. So if you have something else to do at the same time, uh, maybe something to keep you financially afloat, that's okay. But I, I definitely wouldn't think that anyone was lazy for not uh, not working at the same time as doing them because they are so tricky. Yeah. Yeah, I just agree with what um, Rob's just said there. Like I know I had been working and I took a month unpaid leave uh, to do them. And then afterwards, I think I was so drained after it that like I was due to sit them again and I was too busy like holidaying then afterwards I honestly felt like I needed six months to recover <laughs> after trying to do the four in one go and I thankfully I passed them but then like I actually had to wait a full year before I could do it again and you know and I and like that's the thing that they're not as Rob as well said earlier they're not an easy feat and I, I wouldn't be concerned about being lazy like no, fair play. If, you, if you, anyone does the FE ones, I'm like, you couldn't pay me to do them again. So fair play to anyone who's willing to take them on. <laughs> yeah, and I think from a HR perspective, you know, um, as recruiters, we don't see it lazy at all. And, I, you know, a lot of people have asked about this summer and, you know, this, this summer that's just gone by and, you know, they've lost internships and placement programs. And it, that's really, really hard, you know. And, you know, you've lost that time that maybe you had planned to go into an office. You know, I think recruiters will, will take that into mind. And, you know, a lot has changed for us. So we recognize that a lot has changed for you as well. Um, and, you know, you're sitting your FE ones, you're not doing it up and you're still in your working towards your long-term goal. And that's the way you need to see it is, okay, maybe I can't get part-time work right now or full-time work, but I am working on something that's helping to develop me to get me to my long-term goal. So I always think positively because, you know, you're all doing such a good job. You're studying, you might do an FE ones, you're, you're trying to get work. So, you know, it's not easy. And um, so I don't think it seems lazy at all. You know, if you haven't got legal work experience, my advice is to always seek out legal work experience where you can. Um, and if you're in university, you know, can you get two weeks at Easter or, you know, your holidays and things like that. Obviously, always seeking out legal work is good, but I understand the circumstance at the moment can mean it's a little bit tricky. So I think the overall kind of consensus is that, no, it doesn't seem lazy at all. Um, and we, we wish you the best of luck with your FE ones. Um, and they're very doable. I know our trainees are saying they're very, very tricky, but they are they are hard work, but they're really, really doable as well. So you will get them and you will pass them. Okay, uh, Elise, a question for you. How did you find the process of joining Eversheds without having done a summer internship? Um, okay, so yeah, well, I, I had moved to Dublin and I was working as a paralegal in a smaller firm. 
Um, to be honest, I don't think it put me at any disadvantage having not done the internship. Um, it was when I joined, obviously some people knew each other from the internship, but again, there was so many of us that it was completely new to um, and that we hadn't worked in Evershed before. And as a group, everyone is meeting for the first time anyway. And I suppose I felt that I still had experience. I still had got experience by working in a law firm prior to working in Eversheds, which I do think that part was important for me um, that I wanted to have, you know, a little bit done before I started the training contract. Um, but overall wise, I mean, I I didn't even think twice about not like it, it didn't. I don't think it was a disadvantage not doing it. And of course, when you go in on the day and you're meeting everyone anyway, everyone is in the same position. Everyone's meeting each other for usually the first time. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it was as long as you have maybe, if possible, some work experience that you've gotten somewhere else. Um, I would say that, yeah, it was it wasn't a disadvantage to me not having done it. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, all the trainees kind of come in on level footing anyway, even if if they have interned before, okay, they might be more familiar with the IT systems or um, they might be more familiar with who to ask what question to, you know, in terms of, oh, look, I've got stuck with research, I'll go to the Knowledge Centre. So, yeah, I think it takes the trainings that haven't interned a little bit longer, but in terms of work, I think they're very much level because the next question actually kind of feeds into that is, you know, and this will go to Chloe or Robert, but that transition from summer intern to traineeship, you know, how was that? And what was that a big jump? How did you manage it? Um, I know that I obviously had a break in between, like, so I've been in for the summer internship and then I came back, you know, I think just over a year later as a trainee. So um, what I was familiar with, you know, who was who kind of, but um, I, I did feel kind of different. Uh, and as well, I started with my, in, like, my intake as well. So it's a different group of people to who I was in summer internship with. Um, and, you know, it was really helpful that you have your intake to kind of lean on. You're kind of saying, you know, if someone asked me, do you know where I go for the, you know, to post something? And I'm like, oh yeah, I think it's this person. And, you know, things had changed a little bit since I had been in, but as well, you know, there's people who've done a pre seat who hadn't done summer internships, so they might know something or, and I'll say, actually, I think I don't remember this from a summer internship. And I do think I really relied on like the intake and, you know, it was a WhatsApp group and really just asking each other for advice and stuff like that when you're in the firm or like, they know who's on Rosa today. Things like that um, are really helpful that you have your intake. So regardless of doing the summer internship or not, you do kind of lean on each other, um, you know, and even just for your event at the end of the day saying, oh God, you know, I, I couldn't find this or whatever like that. And someone will go, oh God, you know, let me help you with this next time and that kind of thing. So as much as you're kind of saying, oh, summer internship or trainee, it's as well the group, like on the summer internship, I had a good group of people, like Rob was on summer internship with me. Um, and then similarly then when I was a trainee, I had my, in, I had my intake now. Um, and that's, I think, the kind of real resource in the firm anyway, because we're everywhere. All the trainees are everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Rob, do you want to feed that in, into that question as well? Like, how did you find that change from intern to trainee? Yeah, um, again, it was, it was about uh, a year or two between my summer internship and starting my training uh, itself. But um, I think in terms of the work itself, you are, you're definitely given trainee level work as an intern. But I think when you become a trainee, there is a step up of expectation, which is perfectly accepted. I mean, that, that you, are, you are now at your next step. You definitely need to perform to a higher level. Um, I, I don't think that there's kind of a huge expectation that someone would you know, shout at an intern or a trainee really for getting something wrong. But there's definitely just an increase in expectation of work because you're now you're looking to qualify. So that is definitely a change in terms of culture, however, in the firm. Uh, summer interns, because it's such a long time, it's 11 weeks uh, for your summer internship. You become part of your team in a much stronger way than, say, in other firms where I've done internships where you are only there for four weeks and you're kind of seen as a novelty. I think you definitely become a part of your team. You're relied on, particularly towards the end when you've, you've shown that you, know, you can do the work. You do become a bit of an asset to the team. And it's the same in, in your traineeship as well. You, you become an asset the longer you're in there and you can understand things. So I think there's just the only major change was just you're now at your next stage and you need to perform to that level instead of kind of when you're a summer intern arriving and everyone's a bit more understanding of you've never been here or you may be 
maybe your first legal work experience. But that's that's the only real difference for me. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And something Rob touched on there is you know become an integral part of the team and. Um, obviously our trainees are a huge part of the team and even when it comes to the end of rotations partners are always you know touching base with me can we keep them for another month or can we change and I'm like no we have to move them along you know we have to keep going and it happens believe it or not with the 11 week summer program like partners come back to me and think they can keep their their interns indefinitely like you know and say oh can I keep so and so you know she's working on this big deal so she's an integral part and and that intern may need, need to go back to university or go on and do what they need to do and have other plans and whatnot so sometimes our interns do stay on um and the partners to be delighted but it just kind of shows how important our trainees and interns are to us in the business and the teams they're there's just such an important part of the firm and they're really valued so thanks chloe and rob for that and the next question um and it's not a basic question at all we get it asked all the time and um, could you explain ppc1 and ppc2 what they are and chloe i might put this question to you because you've done both ppc1 and ppc2 so you might give us an overview um, yeah, so PPC1, um, we go, well, you go to the Law Society, well, unfortunately, I don't think this in, the, the, this year's intake is, um, and you kind of are divided into tutorial gr like groups, um, and that kind of basically becomes your like base class, I suppose, is the nearest kind of comparison, um, and you kind of, there's mandatory subjects that you do, uh, as well as kind of like skills, um so it's, it's kind of like just going back to college uh i'm not sure how many hours anyone does in college at the moment but probably more hours than in college and um, but it's great because everyone realizes that you know this is the last kind of well hopefully last kind of college experience we get um before you know our the length of our careers basically so everyone really just makes the most of it there's a lot of sports and social kind of aspects to it like i helped run the the gas society when i was there um, hadn't played ga in years. <laughs> I think under 12 player of the year was my peak and then I stopped but um, I went back uh, just to kind of like just to the crack really and like we just did quizzes, played matches and we, we lost near, I think every match um, but you know it was great crack because we would just go to the Glimmerman afterwards, have a few drinks um, and just for six months we kind of just got to be students and have a lot of fun. Um, so then PPC2 is you know we're, you go into the office then for 12 months and then the idea is that we all go back to the Law Society to kind of uh, have our last three months of um, freedom. But uh, unfortunately, COVID this year kind of changed things. Um, so instead of going to the Glimmerman, I was having Zoom quizzes like everyone else. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and there's no, you don't really go to kind of like, you have a base class, but it's not really the same as in PPC1. It's a, it, the kind of, the work you're kind of there to more just like qualify now that people are you, you choose your subjects and um, so like i think you can do kind of like medical law and um, and like advanced litigation and um, like i did corporate transactions banking and um, and i forget the last subject that i did now but um it's you can kind of you, you, it's a bit more kind of you're free to choose things as you like um and there's less of an aspect of kind of sports and social um but you're sure you're friends with most people anyway from ppc1 so you're still keeping in you like you keep in contact with them throughout the like the year and even like our whatsapp group will still kind of like from our tutorial group in ppc1 would be one where you know does anyone have that does anyone have a template for something and uh, or like does anyone know i'm actually in course does anyone know what's going on or in xyz so um yeah that's that's PPC1 and PPC2 I'll look back wistfully on. Um, but yeah, I'm obviously the guys probably have, uh, they're in PPC1 more recently, so they'll probably have better uh, stories um, to share. <laughs> yeah, Rob, Elise, would you just like to give us a rundown of what's involved in PPC1? Yeah, yeah so. Um, okay, you, you go, Rob. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so PPC1 is in a, in a, in a basic form is just as you're learning your professional practice course it's it's a much more practical version of, of the law degree essentially you know you're kind of figuring out how to properly apply the things in litigation what forms to use for various bits it's 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 like doing a law degree for six months but uh in a much more practical sense as opposed to theoretical sense um as Lou was saying it is very social it's it's very much a networking uh thing because it's 
all of your colleagues from across the country uh, get together for six months and it's it's a very unusual time i don't think any other career has something similar um and it's it's well known for being good fun but it is um it is tricky towards the end you know you do have your exams and you have to pass those um and you do have a few practical exams which you know your skills for advocacy and and you have to do like a recorded uh, application in front of a barrister so it's, there's a bit of work to be done and it is uh, but it is it is good fun and it's much more teaching you the practicalities of how to function in a law firm as opposed to your law degree which might teach you the theory of uh, of law itself yeah absolutely and to give you a note like to put that into the picture to give you an overview so you're in your degrees now you may go on to do masters you'll go on to do your fe ones you'll secure your traineeship you then within your two and a half year traineeship you'll do four rotations with us and two stints in black hall and those two stints are ppc1 and ppc2 which the guys have explained now for anybody listening here will they be called ppc1 and ppc2 when you join probably not um if you go onto the Law Society website, um, first of all, they give you lots of information with PPC1 and PPC2, but they're also, um, I suppose, making some changes. Um, and because our trainees go out twice during their traineeship, so they go to Black Hall for PPC1 and PPC2, they're now going to combine that. Um, the program is going to be much more, um, you know, there's got to be different types of modules and how they run those modules. It's going to be very practical. So um, PPC1 and PPC2, I think by next September, we probably won't be calling it that. We'll be calling it PPC and it won't be two stints it'll be one stint going down to black hall so i think our trainees were lucky to um to get down twice and um, but you guys joining traineeships might not be um so lucky but the training will be fantastic and they're making lots of improvements and developments to the program so thank you for that question uh, good morning, Ashley. Uh, in terms of the application, there is one little question at the back of the trainee application which asks you to provide any other relevant information. Can I ask how the panel would have approached this question, please? Um, I'm conscious they probably all did their applications quite some time ago, but um, would any of you like to feed into that? I actually do remember a very specific, that was, it, it was a very specific question, but I do have an answer for it because when I went to my um, in my interview, uh, the, I think there's a, a number of sections for work experience and I had filled them out with legal work experience, but there's only a certain number of segments that you could fill in. And uh, I had my interview with Stephen Barry, who uh, Chloe worked for, and we ended up talking more about that relevant section because I had worked in retail throughout uh, my law degree. And we spoke about that and how that transfers. So I, in that segment, I put in uh, work experience which wasn't legal because I think I wanted to put in the uh, the legal work experience first in the main segments so for that that particular box I had a lot of retail work in there and it did uh, it, it was spoken about quite heavily in my, my interview. Great and what I'd say about that box is um, that box is there like what Rob did he didn't have space for something or if you don't know where to put something it generally falls into that box so what we often see coming through there is if you want to include more information on your thesis if there's anywhere in the application where um you're like i don't know where this slots it doesn't slot into education i can't put it into my hobbies then put it in there so if there's anything that you want us to know that there's no actually allocated space on your application then pop it in there and um, probably 80 percent of the applications that come in it's blank because they have filled everything in and it's fine chloe elise can either of you remember that or, or whether you put anything into that box I think from my memory, which it was a while ago, but I think I left that blank. I think I yeah. think I just had everything covered in my in my application, and I didn't want to fill it just for the point of it. So I think I left it. I left it blank. Yeah, there's no points deducted or anything like that for not filling that that box out. I kind of I think sorry. I think I remember doing like my kind of last ditch like elevator pitch in that box, kind of like this is my final go. This is why you should hire me. Um, which either came across as desperate or as, you know, very committed. But um, yeah, that's what I did with mine, I think. Great. Thank you. Uh, would you recommend doing the summer internship program? So this would be for Chloe or Rob. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, any, uh, any legal work experience is going to be beneficial. Uh, I think ours was particularly interesting because of its length. Um, you do definitely get it, it's more work-based as opposed to some of the other 
summer internship programs where say you're in in a firm for three weeks they're just gonna you're just gonna be given an IT induction and then you'll 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 leave so I think doing a summer internship itself is always going to be beneficial because you're going to get into an office you're going to do some good work uh doing r1 because of its length i think is more beneficial because particularly if you were going into an interview scenario you have so many examples of things that you've done you can talk about so much more than just if you're in a, a very short intern internship where you know you can talk about the and then some of the parties that you went to and that's about it i definitely would always recommend one though if you can if you can apply for one and get one definitely give it a go it's always worth it yeah and i think as well i think sometimes students and graduates think you know i have to secure an internship in you know a, a top law firm or top 10 some of the smaller law firms give fantastic work experience you don't have to you know, I know in university, you know, the top 10 names can go around or, you know, and you may want to work in them. That may be your goal and that's fine. But do you do remember that there's some local law firms, smaller law firms that keep fantastic work experience as well? Chloe, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, well, I agree with everything that Rob said. I know for me anyway, um, I don't think I would have left my job to do a summer internship of only four weeks. And I remember kind of like I think even I spoke to you or at the time just saying like will I actually get like proper work because I didn't want to go from doing you know a nine to six job to then kind of go in and just be kind of like sitting in an office I didn't want to be bored and I definitely kind of then was you know got a lot of hands-on experience um similar to Rob I was in litigation kind of going down to court taking attendances um and then kind of by the end of it being left like okay yeah you get your taxi then you do that and you know it was such a thrill at the time and definitely kind of confirmed yeah this is actually a career I want to do um which I think is important because I think often in college and you know that you can kind of think yeah and I'm going to be this and then all of a sudden you know you might realize one day like actually I've kind of just been steamrolled towards this point and I don't really know if I actually like the work um, and like I, I think there's someone who's in my PPC one who has now dropped out of a top firm because it's just been a case where he's just been constantly following a process and I'm not sure he'd actually ever worked in the firm before he went in after PPC one um, and so I definitely would recommend people just to see can you actually see yourself doing this like as a long-term career uh, it's definitely worthwhile doing some internship um, just to it just in case you had any doubt uh, and as well even just for the experience it was, and as Rob said it's brilliant to speak about in an interview and um, the experience you got on the internship as well yeah Absolutely, thank you. How much weight is given to your college results compared to the FE1 results in the traineeship application? I'm hoping that my FE1 results will be better than my college grades. Um, I'm, I might answer this first, I suppose. Um, the FE1 results really have, have no weighting, I'm afraid. Um, we ask what FE1 results you've done, um, but they're not necessarily going to pull you through the application process um, and some people you know that have eight fe ones and some one person might have zero but the person with zero might get through because they have a strong application but i suppose if we bring this back to you know your college results and you were hoping to get stronger fe ones than your college results and um, there is a section on your application where you can explain maybe if you feel that your college results are, are low and um, we often have applications coming through and their college results may be low or maybe their leaving set points are low and um, but they've pulled that back up um, and you're, you know you want to pull that back up through FE ones and that's fine and like for us academics are not the be all and end all they're really important to us you know we're looking for smart intelligent candidates and um, but if your grades aren't that low really focus on the recs of your application and own your results your results you can't change them they are what they are so own what your results are and if you feel you're happy to give us an, us an explanation as to maybe why your results were low then put that in the box in your application which says is there any reasons why you'd like to explain your exam results um, and that can vary for people some people there's personal circumstances some people i find struggle from that kind of six year leave insert to a whole new way of teaching and learning from like lecture halls to not being told what to do or not being given homework and people struggle with that and um, so you can see a dip in results in kind of first and second year um, so I hope I, you know, I answered that question. The FE ones were not too focused on, you know, the results or anything, but we want to see have you completed any, but it won't necessarily add as such to your application. Where your FE ones do come into play is where 
we say, okay, we, these are two successful candidates. Um, Orla has zero FE1s, but Chloe has eight. Okay, we'll put Chloe in 2022. We'll give Orla a little bit more time and put her into our 2023 intake. Um, so that's where they come into play. But loads of people ask me about results and are, you can be concerned about results in a particular year or low leaving cert points, whatever that might be on them and if you can explain them and if you're happy to talk about them great and really focus on the rest of your application and pulling that up because the results aren't the be all and end all um, and if you have a strong application and um, we'll look at that and we'll say great work experience really well written application okay results are a bit low maybe we'll talk about that in an interview and see how she got and how she did um, so just to bear that in mind does anybody in the panel have anything to add about results or advice around that I do actually think that if you had um, a relatively poor, I, I did have an example for it where I didn't particularly get in first year, I didn't, it contract just sort of mess, it didn't, it didn't go well for me on the day. Um, and a point that was raised in an interview was what happens and have you done anything to improve on that? And you could use your FE1 as a point of, well, I, that didn't go well for me, say with contracts or constitutional, whichever the FE1 is say that I, I learned from my mistake and really put in a lot of work to improve it and I got it with this result. So um, it just shows the drive to improve as opposed to necessarily stopping you from, from getting any training contract. It could be used in that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm similar to Rob actually in my, in my traineeship interview, um, my leaving cert points, even though like I wasn't very happy with them and um, there was obviously a notable like increase in what I finished on in my degree and like I think what Rob said like it shows a drive like in my interview it said to me like there was an evident change in your results like how did you manage that or what did you do and like that it just shows I think you know that you kind of took the decision right I'm going to try really hard in college now and I'm sure like it applies to you know like that maybe an exam goes wrong for you you know it happens like I wouldn't get too bogged down with results, you know, obviously you want to try your best at them, but I wouldn't let it put you off applying for something, you know, like Orla said, it's not the be all and end all. And, you know, like it's it's important, I guess, to get the results you want, but also it's not everything. And I think it works well in an interview if you're able to say, well, I got X results and then evidently I tried really hard and I pulled it back and this is what I got, so yeah. And just as well, I just add, if, if you've kind of done your degree and you're kind of concerned that like your degree isn't as high as maybe other people applying, I'd always recommend like, well, you know, get work experience as well, because that's a very practical thing. Because a lot of people sometimes it is just a case exams don't go well. The course isn't set up with a lot of continuous assessment. Um, and at least in work experience, you can really show, you know, that you are capable of the work and that, you know, you have the the mind to do it and everything and you have the work drive to do it um, and so you know I don't think a year of work experience or anything like that is going to look badly when you just it's a practical way of showing your abilities as opposed to just having a, your degree kind of um, result as a, it alone. Absolutely. Um, I'm conscious of time, so um, we might take maybe one or two more questions briefly and, and then we'll close off. Um, how important is work experience in the applications? I'm going into my final year, but I've struggled to get work experience. Um, I think for internship, you know, there's no expectation that you do have work experience. Um, you know, I think Chloe and uh, Rob did have a bit of work experience, but there's no expectation at internship. And what I'd say is that internship, you know, we're looking to help to give you that work experience. Um, but of course, there are people that do come down, come through at work experience. Um, I think when you're going for a traineeship, it's, it's a little bit more important. It, it doesn't have to necessarily be legal, but we are looking to see, you know, what you've got involved in and what sort of work experience you have. When you get to traineeship, you are competing unfortunately with people that do have legal work experience. So if you don't have that, you really need to sell your, you know, your part-time jobs or if you're working in retail or hospitality or whatever it might be, that you really connect that job to the role. So if I didn't have legal work experience and I was applying for the traineeship, I'd really be trying to think about how does my retail job connect to a law firm? You know, I have customers, they have clients, my communication skills, any skills that I can highlight and pull out that I'll say, okay, I don't have legal work experience, but I have worked in retail um, and I do, um, you know, I am able to apply to a law firm. And I was only, you know, reading an article 
yesterday um, on commercial awareness and it was um, basically a research report and one of the things that holds students back it was around in the UK was commercial awareness but it was found that students with any type of work experience whether that's a part-time job or legal had stronger commercial awareness coming through so you don't have had to have to work in a law firm to have strong commercial awareness but the commercial awareness piece that you're showing there is okay these are the skills that I have in in the part-time job that I can pull in and um, do any of the panel want to feed into that um, yeah, Orla, I, I remember when I was doing my um, application, like I took time before I actually started the traineeship, um, I got a good bit of legal work experience, but I remember when I was filling out the application, I didn't have a whole pile, but I had worked like that in retail for like seven years part time in the same like job at home. Um, and I just kind of, like you said, like built it up, like show how that relates to how this can carry you through in your traineeship you know dealing with clients um again it definitely helps your commercial awareness you know just that you've had you know you've worked before outside of college and outside of being academic it's important i think if you can to try get something down um obviously preferably like legal experience but don't dismiss part-time jobs that you've had i remember writing on an application before that I'd worked as an elf before, which I did. <laughs> so I think, and it was like in the little extra section, and I got the job. So I mean, just like put things down and you know, be honest and don't dismiss like part time work that you've done just because you know you don't think it's relevant. I think if you've had a uh, part time job through college, it shows if not if anything that you can balance um, and that you're committed. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Elise. Um, there are so many um, great questions that we haven't got to there. I'm really, really sorry we, we ran out of time. Um, but if you've sent in a question, we will revert to you uh, via email. We will definitely answer your question and get back to you. Um, and if you'd like your question um, put to any of our trainee panel, let me know and um, I can touch base with them to come back on your answer. But other than that, we will definitely get back with your questions. Um, just to finish, my last question, because I'm conscious now we are over time. So in one or two sentences, guys, what advice would you give the group today, just to close off? If you were back at this stage, what advice would you give? And I might start with you, Chloe. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell I go last. No, I'm joking. Um, my advice would be to, like, don't rush into anything. Like, you know, take you know I, I obviously there's questions about like doing the fe ones while doing a master's and you know like it's you know i'm about 27 now and like when i look back when i started the fe ones 23 like it doesn't feel like that long ago um and like there's a lot of stuff to enjoy you know especially when you finish college like i really enjoyed just being able to work and have my own money um and you know go see friends and like not be worried about paying for you know big dinner with friends and a few drinks so there's things that are just like they're small milestones but they're to be enjoyed and not to be like oh i can't go for dinner because i actually i'm going to take a month you know unpaid leave and i have to be up and study early saturday morning like just enjoy the bit of time while you're well we're all young and all that kind of thing and um, and like what you know it will all kind of fall into place and um, and like obviously put in the time when it comes to when you decide to do FE1s, do the FE1s, put in the bit of time and work that they deserve, um, similar with the traineeship applications, but don't, I wouldn't be rushing too quickly to do it all. Great, thanks Chloe. Rob, I'll move on to you. Uh, yeah, I think the, the one the one thing I, I wish I'd known was just don't take anything for granted when you think that, you know, you may have been top of the class in school, you may be uh, great academically in, in well, like it's a great university, don't take for granted that you're going to get into any massive firm. You need to put in the time for your applications. You need to be prepared and you just need to give your FE1s, your applications, your interviews, the respect they deserve because you're not just guaranteed to waltz in just because you were, you were good. I definitely took things for granted when I was early on in my law degree and when they didn't work out, I was disappointed. And now you realize it's because you didn't didn't give it the, the kind of time it needed. So take the time with what you're applying for and be be prepared for them. Great, and Elise? Yeah, so I think a big thing for me would be to have confidence in your abilities. 
don't let things that people might say, well, that won't work in an application. Like, don't say this, don't say that. To a point, like, own it. Do your own application um, and your internships or your traineeships or whatever is to come for you guys. Um, have confidence in what you can do. Um, like, I think for me as well, maybe they would... I kind of I remember thinking at the time when I was doing my traineeship like oh I didn't go to college in Dublin and blah blah people kind of were saying oh you'll find that kind of difficult blah blah to get in and I did you know it didn't work to my disadvantage like if anything you know it was you know I did a slightly different course I did law plus and you know I probably at the time looking back just had no confidence in that at all and I just think own what you're doing and obviously as Rob said give the interviews and the applications the time they deserve and the FE ones. Um, but yeah, have confidence in what you can do. Great. Thank you all for that advice. Um, thank you so much to everybody for logging on um, today for our last uh, session of the Breakfast Club. I'm sorry to see the week come to an end. I know I really enjoyed it. Um, and thank you because I know there's a lot of people that are logged on that we have been speaking to throughout the week as well. So thank you so much. We hope that you enjoyed this session and, and that you got a lot out of it. Thank you so much for your, your great questions and we'll get back to all the questions that are coming in now. And again, thank you to the panel uh, for their time this morning. Thanks everyone. Have a good morning. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Olivia.